This morning, I'm going to begin a series of messages that I'm calling Faces in the Crowd. It is focusing upon those who surrounded the cross of Christ, and I want to begin this series by looking at Simon of Cyrene. He was a man from what today is called Tripoli, Cyrene, in the country of Libya, in North Africa, a country that's been in our news a great deal over the last few years because of what happened at Benghazi. But this man made a trip by crude ship of 900 miles all the way from North Africa to no doubt Joppa, one of the leading seaports of the land of Israel. It would have taken several weeks to make that trip. And for this man, it must have been the fulfillment of a dream of a lifetime. Every able-bodied Jewish man in the whole Roman world wanted at least once to visit Jerusalem, the holy city, to them to observe one of their annual feasts. And Simon was on his way to do that. There were no doubt others from Cyrene who made the trip with him. And at the time of this feast, which was Passover, all the roads leading to Jerusalem would be filled with pilgrims. And Simon was one of those. Up the dusty roads they went across the hills and the dells. They crossed dry spring beds. And finally, they came to the last hill. And when they came to the top of it, they looked across the valley, and there it was, the city of David. They must have rejoiced to at last be at Jerusalem. They crossed the valley, went up to the walls of the city. They may have entered the gate that was called Beautiful. And coming into the city itself, people were everywhere. And they were moving in a direction. Simon was caught up in the crowd and was borne along with it. And it was apparent before long that something unusual was happening at this feast and on this day. Crowds were lining the streets, and Simon became a part of that crowd. Simon of Cyrene is how we know him. And I want us to begin this morning by looking at his country. The city was Cyrene. The country is Libya. And we're in North Africa. If, if you looked at a map of that part of the world, you would see how far the journey was. And this city had been populated by 100,000 Jewish people, transported there by a man by the name of Ptolemy. The name begins with a P, but the P is silent. He is Ptolemy. We need to know something about the background of all of that. 
When Alexander the Great's kingdom was divided upon his death, it was given to four of his generals. Two of them were in the far west of a biblical map of the time, but the other two surrounded the land of Israel. In the north, there was the Seleucids, named for one of those generals. They were in Syria and that part of the world. Down in Egypt, the southern part, there were the Ptolemies, named for that general. In between, there was Israel. And there were times that Israel was dominated by the Seleucids and sometimes by the Ptolemies because, you see, there was hardly a time in Israel's history when she was not dominated by somebody. And when Ptolemy was given his part of the kingdom, he sent 100,000 Jews over to North Africa. They became a part of Cyrene. By the time that Jesus came, 300 years later, the city of Cyrene was bursting at the seams with Jewish people. They were called Hellenists because they were Jews who spoke the Greek language. They had become a part of their culture. And at that time in history, it was a Greek culture. And the men, the Jews of Cyrene, are mentioned at least four times in the New Testament in the book of Acts. For example, in chapter 2, we learn that on the day the church began, there were men from Cyrene in Jerusalem. Now, the church began about 50 days after the Passover feast. And Simon had come to Jerusalem for Passover, I can't help but wonder if he stayed over to Pentecost. I'm sure he did. And then, if he did, he was a part of that group of men from Cyrene who were there to hear Peter preach in Acts 2. They're also mentioned in Acts chapter 6. There was a synagogue, a Jewish place of worship in Jerusalem that was called the synagogue of the freed men and among those who occupied the synagogue were men from Cyrene. Later, after the church is established and persecution broke out against the church and the disciples were scattered from Jerusalem all the way up north in Israel and over into Syria, there were men from Cyrene who brought the gospel to Antioch, the place where the church was located that would be the great mission-minded church of the first century. And in Acts 13, when Paul is getting ready to go on his first missionary journey, there are certain people in the church who are named, and one of them is a prominent man from Cyrene. So Simon, being from Cyrene, had a rich heritage, and also he belonged to a group that became New Testament Christians. Now let's look at the man. The man is from Cyrene but he is a Jew. And we notice that first. He is a Jew. He has a Jewish name. His ancestors were probably among those who had been transported by Ptolemy there so long before. Second, I know he was a dedicated Jew because he made that journey all the way from North Africa over to Jerusalem when most people 
did not. And I also know that this man is found in the New Testament in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We don't know much about him, but they tell his story, and it's his story that we want to emphasize today. And we want to place emphasis upon his experience in Jerusalem. You remember a few moments ago we said that he was a part of the crowd that lined a street of Jerusalem and that something unusual was taking place? For you see, at that very time and at the, on that very day, there was a procession moving through the streets of Jerusalem. Simon was there. What did he see? What did he experience? Well, he might have seen a Roman centurion because the event that he was to be witness to was carried out by Romans. There might have been a centurion riding on a white horse, leading a procession, but it was made up of two columns of Roman soldiers. You can picture that, can't you, with their metal helmets and their breastplates, their swords and spears and their shields. But what Simon saw was not about a centurion or about two columns of Roman soldiers. What he saw was in the midst of those two columns of Roman soldiers, there were three men. And those three men were each carrying the cross beams of a cross, which meant that they were about to die by crucifixion upon those crosses. But if I had been there or if you had been there, I'm sure that our eyes would have been fastened upon, as I'm sure Simon's were, they'd be fastened upon one of those three men carrying the cross beams of the cross. The one whose garments were bloody because he had experienced a Roman scourging the night before. And a Roman scourging left the victim body with scars of bleeding. He would have been the one that was wearing a, a crown of thorns in mockery of his claim. And from the wounds of the thorns, there must have been blood and perspiration running down his face. And I wonder if Simon must have been thinking, why doesn't someone wipe his brow? There's something else about that one. It looked like he was about to collapse. And then Simon was surprised, and he was even shocked because a Roman soldier tapped him to be the bearer of the cross of Jesus. When Rome ruled the world, they could bring any person, any animal, anything into their service, whoever they chose, whatever they chose. And the Romans tapped Simon to carry Jesus' cross. And Luke says that he carried the cross after Jesus. And Scripture tells us that they brought Jesus. A word that might mean they carried him, and if he, they carried him, it was because of the ordeal he'd been through, he was not able to carry his cross, and he was not able to bring himself. They took him through one of the northwestern gates of the city of Jerusalem, out to a little hill that was called in the Hebrew Golgotha. In Greek, it was called Cranian. Latin expressed it by Calvaria. 
It was a place of execution. It was a place of the skull, it was called. Maybe because people died there, or perhaps because, and this is probably the correct reason, it was a little hill that looked like a human skull. And there were caves in the side of it for the eyes and nose and mouth. I've seen a hill outside of Jerusalem that is purported to be that hill, and it does resemble a human skull. Regardless, they brought him to the top of Golgotha, and there they nailed him to a Roman cross and they crucified him between two thieves, perhaps to indicate that he was the vilest of the three. And Simon was a face in that crowd. Simon saw it all. And Simon went from Jerusalem to Golgotha with Jesus. Now, we've looked at the city and we've looked at the man. Let's now look at the questions. There are some questions that I want to raise. There, there are some questions I'd like answered. And the first one is, I wonder if Simon realized who Jesus was. Now, we don't know for sure what the answer is at that point. We know that he saw Jesus. We know that he bore his cross. Therefore, we know that he came to Golgotha. But did he really know who Jesus was? We want to believe, for reasons I shall show in a moment, that he came to know who he was. But the real question today is, do you know who he was? Simon Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. What do you think about him? And if you believe him to be who he claimed to be, the Christ of God, I want to ask, connected with this first question, do you know him? Not do you know about him or not do you believe that he was who he claimed to be, but do you know him? Do you know him in a personal relationship? You can, you know. In 1 John 2, verse 3 of the New Testament, John says, by this, we know that we know him. If we keep his commandments. The question is, do you know who he is and do you have a relationship with him because you're seeking to keep his commandments? There's a second question. We wonder if Simon touched Jesus. And here again, we're not given a clear answer. He might have touched Jesus. After all, Jesus is bearing the cross beam of the cross and Simon takes up the cross. He might have touched him. But what I really like to ask today, have you touched him? In Matthew chapter 8, there was a leper who came to Jesus and said, if you will, you can make me whole. This man had a disease that had fastened itself to his flesh that knew no human cure. It ate away at the flesh and the bones and, and finally it would kill the victim. If one had leprosy, he was under the sentence of death and only a divine hand could heal leprosy. And this man believed Jesus, if you will, you can make me whole. Jesus said, I will. And he touched him. 
and the leper was made whole. You and I and the whole human race has been infected by the leprosy of sin. And only Jesus is the answer to our problem. It is essential that we touch him. Not that we touch him physically or even literally touch his flesh, but that we touch him in what he's offering. Listen to this statement from Romans chapter 6 and verse 3. Paul said, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Now, there are a number of things in that statement that we need to consider. One of them is, Paul says that we were baptized into Christ. That suggests that before we were baptized, we were not in Christ. Second, he says those who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death. What happened in his death? In his death, Jesus shed his blood on that central cross of Calvary. And it is by the power of that blood that you and I can be washed and made clean from our sins. Therefore, it is essential that we contact, that we touch the blood. Therefore, we must get into his death. Paul said in the next verse in Romans 6, we're buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ, there's something we're picturing here, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, we also should walk in newness of life. Now, what happens to you when you're baptized? Well, you're buried in water. Why do you do that? Because God asks you to. But something happens. It isn't a, a bath that's taking place. It isn't the washing away of the dirt of the flesh, as Peter put it. It's not that at all. Listen to another passage found in Colossians 2 and verse 12. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also we are raised with him through faith in the working of God. Now, first of all, in our baptism, we picture the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. We do this in obedience to the divine command. But notice, Paul says we are raised through faith in the working of God. God does something in that act. What does he do? God, by the blood of Jesus, cleanses us from all sin because we've been baptized into the death of Christ. Oh, yes, I wonder. Did Simon touch him? But more importantly, have you touched him? There's a third question. Did Simon hear Jesus? Were there any words spoken between them? I don't know. I know that on the way to the cross, Jesus spoke words because he spoke to certain women who were in the crowd along the streets. 
who were weeping over him, seeking to give them some kind of comfort. And I know later that on the cross he spoke, there were those seven sayings of Christ. But I don't know whether Simon actually heard him speak or not. But that aside, I want to ask today, are you hearing what Jesus says? Matthew chapter 17, verse 5, has God speaking from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2 says, God in these last days has spoken unto us by his son. That's the reason that as the disciples of Jesus, we always want to give the word of Christ, the new covenant, the new testament. We always want to give the word of Christ for what we believe, teach, practice. Because we're trying to, to hear him. There's another question. Did Simon follow Christ? Well, I know from the biblical text that he bore the cross after Jesus, so he followed him on the way to Golgotha. I know that. but did he become a follower? But more importantly for us today, have you become a follower of Jesus? In John 10, 28 and 29, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give to them eternal life. There's not one among us who would not wish for and long for life eternal. And Jesus says, then be my sheep. And what do sheep do? Sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. We want to follow him as the good shepherd. There's another question. Did Simon experience transformation because he came in contact with Christ? Now, there are some clues given us in the New Testament that would help us answer that question, at least partially. Was Simon transformed? Or was he just present? Was he just a face in the crowd? Or did it make a difference in his life? Now notice two things. There are four gospel records, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the New Testament. Three of those, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are called the synoptic gospels, a word that means they're so much alike. The question is, how are Matthew, Mark, and Luke so much alike and yet so different? There are differences. They don't contradict each other. They just tell us different things. But John is, even though he records some of the same things that Matthew, Mark, and Luke does, his gospel stands pretty much alone in that it tells us so much that the others do not tell us. Now, Matthew's gospel, scholars believe, was written for a Jewish audience. If you want to look into that further, do so, but the evidence is there. Luke wrote for a Greek audience. He addressed his gospel and the book of Acts, the two books that he wrote to Theophilus. He wrote for a Greek audience. John wrote for a universal audience. But it is believed far and wide that Mark wrote 
for a Roman audience. And that's significant for what I'm about to say. Mark, if he wrote for a Roman audience, and we believe he did, would write things that people in Rome would be familiar with. And when Mark, the briefest of all the Gospels, but who fills in some details the others do not, when Mark tells us about Simon bearing the cross of Christ, he says Simon was the father of Alexander and Rufus. Now, why is that important? The others don't mention it. Why identifies Simon as the father of? Unless the people, the recipients of his gospel record, knew the other people mentioned. So Alexander and Rufus must have been known to the Romans and obviously to the disciples in Rome. Now, in the 16th chapter of Paul's letter to the Roman church, he is listing a number of people that he wants to send greeting to. And in that list, he mentions Rufus, whose mother became like a mother to Paul, and he wanted to send them greetings. Now, we don't know if that Rufus was the same Rufus that Mark mentioned in his gospel, but it's an unusual name. And so it may just be this way. Simon did bear the cross of Christ, and Simon did become a disciple. And he taught his wife and his sons, and the sons later moved to Rome and were well known to the church there, the whole family did, in fact, experience the transformation of conversion. And whether that all falls into place or not, I want to ask, have you experienced the transformation of being a new creation in Christ? There's another question. Did Simon really carry the cross? John says that Jesus carried the cross. Matthew, Mark, and Luke say that Simon carried it. Unbelievers say that's a contradiction, and so the Bible isn't to be trusted. However, it's quite simple in the answer. Jesus bore the cross, just like John says. But when he could no longer bear it, then Simon bore it, just like Matthew, Mark, and Luke say. Simon did literally bear the cross, didn't he? And the question for us is, are you bearing the cross? In Matthew 16, 24 and following, Jesus said, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself. One of the toughest things anybody will ever do. Let him deny himself, let him say no to himself and let him take up his cross. We will pay any price. We will bear any burden. We will make any sacrifice to follow him. Take up your cross. Follow me. Is that what we're doing? Are you bearing your cross? And the last question is this. Did Simon recognize his own need? Well, if what we've been suggesting is true, yes, we can say he did. Because in the death of the one whose cross he bore to the place of execution, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Son of God, died for our sins. And he was buried and he rose again the third day According to the scriptures, that's the heart and the core of the gospel according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. 
I don't know the details of Simon, but I do want to ask this. Do you see your need? Two thousand years have passed since Jesus died on that central cross. But in a very real sense, the cross lives on because Christ lives on. And the rains of two thousand years cannot wash away the power of his blood. And the wind can't blow away his footprints in the sand because he lives today. And in that cross is the only hope. It is the only hope for the world. Do you have the hope? Let's stand and sing. Joining hands and hearts as one, let us reach out.